Well, good evening, everybody. How are you? Sounds pretty good. Um, I will start off by saying God uses the most inadequate instrument to accomplish his will so there'll be no mistaking his will. Uh, so if you, if, you tr if you track my background, which is hard to listen to, uh, God has put me in places I should have never been uh, so that if anything good happens, people would have to attribute it to something other than me. They'd have to say, there must be some grace going on there or something, you know? So that's how I find myself coming from a barbell company to the president of a college. You go figure that one out just by itself. Um, what I wanted to do tonight, if you bear with me, is to talk about a subject or a topic that I think gets too little attention, especially in the Catholic world, uh, and that is, that is sport. Today, you know, sport affects the entire world. It's, uh, it generates hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, I've often heard people say one of two things related to sport, especially from a Catholic perspective. Either I will hear, well, yeah, I know there's not good stuff in it. I know there's some, you know, bad language used. I know there's this, there's that. But, you know, what are you going to do? That's just the way it is. You know, that's just sport. And, uh, you know, I don't like it, but that's the way it is. And they go to the games and they watch and they just participate. And they say, well, that, I'll just have to take, take it as I get it. Then the other extreme are those that say, I don't, I don't, I hate sport. I, I don't want anything to do with it. It's this terrible thing. It's a, it's a debauchery. There's all kinds of terrible things going on there. I don't, I don't want to talk about it. I, I don't want to deal with it. I think both positions are untenable. I don't think they're the right positions, certainly from a Catholic perspective, for us to take. We need to readdress sport in a way that it was meant to be dealt with and, and participated in. And tonight, I, I hope to maybe talk about that. One of the problems you see, and I don't know if it was... Uh, purposely done to have this meal earlier so that you could make sure that you get home for Monday Night Football or for uh, the World Series or whatever else might be going on. Um, but I, I, I think pro sport today, in some ways, and it's unfortunate, has become the poster child for vice. So you see, you know, anger, sloth, envy, gluttony, you know, lust. I mean, you go on the list, the seven deadly sins, they're all there, they're on full display. Uh, and that's what you tend to see in pro sport. And I will tell you, my experience has been working with professional athletes. I have met really only the, the greatest people who you'd love to have as friends. They're really great, good people. Unfortunately, those aren't the ones you hear about. You hear about all the problems, all the difficulties, you know, people shooting people, all those kinds of things going on. And it's unfortunate, but that's, that's where we are today. But I think I can make a case for sport being something more than that. Um, the approach I've always taken to working with athletes has been one of dealing with the whole person, body, mind, and spirit, body, mind, and soul. And in doing that, uh, I thought I'd try to give you maybe just one example of how I go about doing that, because very often what you'll see at the end of, a, let's say, an NFL game is a group of guys will kneel down in the middle of the field, they're kneeling down, they're holding hands, they're saying a prayer, and that's really great. I mean, I'm, I'm happy for anybody who's praying, that's really a good thing. But if during the game, I'm cursing at you, spitting on you, pulling your hair, trying to poke your eyes out, trying to take your knee out, eh, there's a little bit of a disconnect to me afterwards if we're all kneeling down and praying. So somehow, this has all got to be integrated into each moment that we're participating in sport. And I give you an example of how that actually happens. I was working with uh, an NFL wide receiver, and we were on an indoor facility. And as you can see, I'm big, I'm tall, I got long arms. At one point in my life, I could actually throw a ball pretty fast. And he's running routes, and I'm throwing him passes. And about the eighth or ninth ball, he drops a ball. And when he drops the ball, he says, I won't say what he said, but it was not a good word, OK? Um, and he yells this word out. And uh, I look at him, and I said to him, what did you say? And he kind of looks at me a little sheepishly, and he says, well, you know, I, I dropped the ball. You know, I said, I, I know you dropped the ball. I said, but, but what did you say? He said, well, you know, I, 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 I dropped the ball. I said, thank you, Jesus, right? He kind of, yeah, he kind of looks at me like I hit him over the head with a two by four, you know, you know, he goes, well, why am I thanking Jesus? I dropped the ball. Now, he was a Christian. He wasn't Catholic. He was a Christian a athlete. And, and uh, I said to him, well, aren't you thankful in all things? I said, it's 1 Thessalonians 5.18. Aren't you thankful in all things? He said, uh, yeah. I said, so thank you, Jesus, right? He goes, thank you, Jesus? I said, yeah, good. Come on back. Yeah. <laughs> now, you may say, well, why, why did you do that? I'm going to give you two reasons. First one is the higher one, which is it's the virtue of gratitude. We are called to be thankful in all things. Bump your head, thank you, Jesus. Win the lottery, thank you, Jesus. You know, um, don't get a great grade on that test paper, thank you, Jesus. Right? Um, you know, it's thank you, Jesus, in all things. 
So he comes back. So first thing is gratitude. That's why he said it. Now, the second reason for saying it, though, is purely pragmatic. This is an NFL wide receiver. He wants to catch a ball better, right? NFL wide receivers can catch. If they drop a ball, it's not because they can't catch. There's a reason he dropped the ball. But while he's kicking the ground and cursing, what doesn't he know? Why he dropped the ball. Because he's caught up in a thing called pride. And sometimes that's a little, you know, kind of throws you off. He's not strutting around saying he's great. He's actually kicking the ground and cursing. You might say, well, how is that pride? Well, part of it is because he's trying to show me how good he is. I don't drop balls. You know, I, I don't drop balls. I got to show you how upset I am because I'm much better than this. So while he is caught up in this prideful expose of kicking the ground and cursing, he does not know the reason he dropped the ball. And so I can just tell you in this particular case, there was a reason. So of course he comes back and I said to him, what happened? And he looks at me with a blank look. I hope you haven't never had that look on your face when maybe a professor asked you a question, you know. Um, and you kind of just stare and you're trying to think, well, what can I, you know, you're trying to mimic back something that you had heard. Um, and I said, so what happened? And he looks at me and he says, uh, I, I'm not sh I, I don't know. I said, okay, I'll say, I'll tell you. I said, you didn't get your head around fast enough. Now, when I say get your head around fast enough, have you ever watched, if any, have, has anybody, does people watch football here? I mean, you watch NFL, like two people, okay. <laughs> Um, if you watch a wide receiver running a route, when he plants and turns to the quarterback, if he sweeps his head, so if he does this, and comes around, while he's doing that, the whole field blurs until his eyes do come around, and it took him a long time, believe it or not, and even if it looked like he did it quickly, to swivel your head around that way, takes a while, and suddenly a ball is on top of you, and it's like a start response, you just throw up your hands, and suddenly the ball is going through your hands or hitting your hands or bouncing off you in, in some way. So let me just show you. You're going to think I have like a nervous tick. That's, you can turn your head that fast. So imagine coming out of a cut right now and you do that. You've just seen a ball 10 yards sooner. You have a much better opportunity to actually see the ball in detail into your hands. Those are the bells from Belmont Abbey right now ringing. Um, <laughs> they are calling me home. Um, but that ability to turn your head that quickly and have energy into the ball is the reason you will actually catch the ball. So anyway, he, doesn't, he didn't know what it was. I told him, you didn't get your head around. And of course, I went through this little exercise with him to get him to turn his head that way for me. And so he, uh, he goes back. He runs some more routes. Maybe he's now run again, maybe eight, nine routes, whatever it is. And he drops another ball. And I see it. He's about to say the word again. And he goes, and he looks back at me, and I go, and, and he says, thank you, Jesus. I said, good, now come back, tell me what happened, right? <laughs> so he comes back, and I said, so tell me, you know, what happened? And now he said, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think I got my head around that. I said, and I agree. I, mean, I would tell him if it wasn't the case. Yeah, I, I saw it perfectly. Yeah, you didn't get your head around on that one. By the end of the day, he, first of all, he's making catches that could be on a highlight reel. I mean, he's making circus catches. He's catching balls like you wouldn't believe. And if he ever drops one, he's saying, thank you, Jesus. I mean, I'm hearing him at the end of the field yelling, thank you, Jesus. I mean, if anybody walked in, they wonder what's going on. But my point is this. You may say, so what was the benefit of that? We did all three things at the same exact moment. He became a better person. He not only mentally was more focused on what he was doing, he physically was performing better, and spiritually he became a better person. And he did all of those things all at the same time in the same moment. So that is what can happen in sport but it typically doesn't happen that way. We tend to compartmentalize and separate things out and say, we'll do some praying over here and then we'll do some playing over here and we'll do something else over there. You know, we'll do some training, some working out, whatever it might be. So what I've tried to do in writing this book, I, I've told your great president here who I've known for a long time and, and you are blessed to have him as a leader. Uh, he is leader nationally uh, in the fight for religious liberty and for colleges, especially Catholic colleges, to live the mission of Export Ecclesiae. But I was talking to him earlier, and um, I was saying to him, I didn't want to write this book. And I really didn't. I didn't have time to write it, didn't want to write it. I won't tell you how it all came about. But again, typical of my life, I ended up writing this book. And in writing it, uh, what I tried to do is two things. Um, one, I get nothing from the book. Everything from that book goes to Bellman Abbey College. But the second reason why was I thought it was an important one, and that was what I was trying to make a case for, is that world-class performance and virtue are not mutually exclusive. 
And I think so much today's world, whether it be sport or business or anything else, we tend to compartmentalize those or separate those out and almost think you have to make a choice. And I'm telling you, you don't have to make a choice. Uh, you can be world class in whatever you're doing and at the same time have those virtues. I was one year, I was talking to the NFL Players Association and uh, all these players in this big ballroom and I said to them, how many of you are trying to perfect the intellectual virtue of art? Yeah, they all, they all looked at me like you came into the wrong room of this building. I mean, what, what, who are you? And I then said to them, how many of you are trying to perfect yourselves as football players? Whole room raises their hand. I said, that is the intellectual virtue of art. It is the right method of external production. If you're trying to perfect whatever you're doing, that is one virtue, but it's only one of the virtues. And I don't know about you, but virtues, you know, my experience has been they don't work in isolation. They, they tend to work together. And so in sport, how are those virtues being integrated? How are they being developed over time? So that was the reason for the book. So tonight what I'm going to attempt to do here, if you'll bear with me, is just share with you a little of what was in the book to kind of give you the sense of these, this integration and how these things can work together. And the book is basically in three broad sections. Um, the first one was preparing the mind to win. The second was making peak performance a common occurrence. And the last one was playing with a passion that never ends. And the first chapter, or that first section of it, um, what I had basically done is I had put down things that, from a psychological standpoint, I had found over the course of my life seemed to affect almost everybody to some degree. And I'm going to share a couple of those with you. But the way I started out the chapter is I wanted to first make a case for sport. Uh, because again, people tend to, I don't know, think sport is some kind of side issue or maybe it's just a hobby on the side or some extracurricular kind of thing. And I, I would make a case that sport is much more integral to who we are as human beings. Um, sport has been around since the beginning of time. It's an amazing thought to think that there's never been a human being ever that has not played. And we think of playing sport like they're two different things. Sport is one form of play. It's the competitive form of play. So every human being plays. I mean, that, that, that must mean something, that we all play. And I thought I'd share this with you, and I probably wouldn't share this with any other audience, but I thought maybe you could take it, where I would actually share with you a couple of the people, and just a few short little quotes um, from people like Socrates or Xenophon, who wrote through Socrates, there, his words, Plato, uh, Aristotle. But just to give you an idea of, this is not just you know, my thoughts about what sports should be, and I'm not one of them, but the greatest minds that have ever been have talked about play and have talked about sport and its role in our world and in our lives and our culture. Um, Xenophon wrote, to have the body active and healthy can be hurtful to you on no occasions, and since we cannot do anything without the body, it is certain that a good constitution will be of great advantage to us in all our undertakings. Later he writes, and indeed, it is shameful for a man to grow old before he has tried his own strength and seen to what degree of dexterity of perfection he can attain, which he can never know if he gives himself over to uselessness, because dexterity and strength come not of themselves, but by practice and exercise. Plato, for he who changes the sports is secretly changing the manners of the young and making the old to be dishonored among them and the new to be honored. Wow, that is an unbelievable insight that Plato had. For he who changes the sports is secretly changing the manners of the young. Plato is recognizing the impact of play and sport on youth. And by changing it, you can actually change the way they live, the way they think, uh, and the way they behave. Aristotle, and as in the Olympic Games, it is not the most beautiful and the strongest that are crowned, but those who compete, for it is some of these that are victorious. So those who act win, and rightly win, the noble and good things in life. Uh, obviously, you have St. Paul, St. Augustine. I'm just going to read this one little phrase. As a boy, I played ball games. St. Augustine? I don't know about you. I don't think of St. Augustine playing ball games. I mean, that, that's not the vision I have of him. Uh, in his book, The Idea of a University, Cardinal John Henry Newman, he wrote about sport. He said, there is, there is then a great variety of intellectual exercises which are not technically called liberal. On the other hand, I say, there are exercises of the body which do receive that appellation. As such, for instance, was the palestra in ancient times, such as the Olympic Games, in which strength and dexterity of body as well as of mind gain the prize. Um, so you have extraordinary individuals writing about the importance of play in our culture and society. And it's interesting that from the beginning of time, 
the earliest uh, artifacts of man, religion and, and sport and play have been very closely aligned. And in some ways today, uh, instead of them being closely aligned, it's almost like sports become its own religion. Uh, if you even just look at the form of stadiums and the, and the, the love of, and the worship that goes on, it's really quite remarkable. Uh, God talks about play. In Proverbs 8, I was God's delight day after day, playing before God all the time, playing in the world, in God's earth. My delight was with humankind. That's remarkable. And play is like wisdom. It is contemplation of the highest things, and it's done for its own sake. Uh, and it's not done for some artificial or mean end. So play, sport, in, from my estimation, has the same ability to lift our eyes to God as do the great cathedrals, the, the masters of, of you know, works of art and so forth. You know, when we think of a cathedral, if you've ever been to Rome, if you've been fortunate enough to be to St. Peter's, I mean, it's awe-inspiring. You go in, I mean, your eyes are raised up. You're, you're drawn to God. Um, sport, I believe, has the same capacity. I don't know if any of you watched the, uh, the London Olympics. Uh, the half mile was run by a guy by the name of David Rhodesia, who led from the beginning of the race. He broke the world record, and he ran the half mile in one minute and 40 seconds. I don't know if you know times. That is just remarkable. And in watching him run, I have to tell you, I was mesmerized watching him run. Because what I saw there was the image and likeness of God. And that's what he was able to do for me. Watching him move drew me to think about that God made this person. And I'm watching, in a sense, some sense of, of God-like quality in this person. Um, we often use the term miracle to describe great plays. You know, 1984 uh, U.S. Olympic team, when it won, it was like the miracle on ice. Uh, we, we think there's something supernatural or above, and there is in a way. There's something supernatural attached to play. As a matter of fact, we are so wired to play that we are even willing to pay to watch other people do it. <laughs> I mean, think, that is a wild thought, right? We love play so much that if I can't do it, I'm going to pay you $70 to go down and watch a football game. Well, may, I'm not going to actually pay you $70 to watch a football game, but somebody is. I mean, those stadiums are usually full with people that are willing to pay that kind of money. Um, but when play is no longer done for its own sake, it runs the danger of becoming a selfish work. And St. Francis de Sales, again, of all people, St. Francis de Sales, talking about sport, play, he says, so again, games of skill which exercise and strengthen body or mind are in themselves both lawful and good. Only one must avoid excess, either in the time given to them or the amount of interest they absorb. For if too much time be given to such things, they cease to be a recreation and become an occupation. And so far from resting and restoring mind or body, they have precisely the contrary effect. So my case for sport is that it is something deep, it is something that is in us, that is something integral to us being human, uh, which is, means we can't just jettison it or accept it in some kind of state that is not what it's called to be, or just say, I don't want anything to do with it. We're called to be involved with it and help to make it what it is called to be. Second chapter of the book, um, this is dealing with some of the psychological things that I came across, and I thought I'd just share this with you. I've asked, you know, many audiences, they'll say, you know, what's the most motivating thing to any, any person? And uh, typically you hear the, the top three are money, power, fame, you know, those are usually the big three that you hear. And uh, I've often said, it, it's none of those. And you probably all know the answer because you're here at the school. Um, and the answer is the most motivating thing to any human being is love. And of course, you thought this was a sport talk and now I'm talking about love. Um, but, but believe me, it, it goes. But let me, let me prove it to you in some way by this analogy or this example. Um, I'll, I'll give you a billion dollars each. Uh, I'll make you president. I don't know if you want to be or not, but I'll make you president. Uh, but the only stipulation to this is that you have to go live on a deserted island for the rest of your life. Is there anybody going to take the deal? Now, there's a few tired parents maybe here that would take a couple <laughs> of weeks on the island, you know. Uh, but nobody's going to go there forever. And why? Because something's missing. If money, power, and fame were truly most motivating, we'd take the deal. They're not. The most motivating thing is love. What's missing on the deserted island is people and the potential for love and relationships, and therefore, we don't want that deal. Uh, and, he, and people use money, power, fame, by the way, really, ultimately, to get the very thing they want most, which is this love. They often fail at it. It's not usually very effective. But that's what they're trying to do very often with the money, power, and fame that they've acquired. Um, 
what I'm going to share with you, and this may, you may, some of you here may, may resonate with this uh, example I'm going to give you, but I found this with every athlete I've ever worked. Uh, it's just a matter of degree of how much it affects them. And I'm going to take all of you at, let's say, one years old. For no particular reason, I'm picking out one. At one years old, all you know is that mom and dad are perfect and they're the whole universe. That's all you know. One, you're not having a big discussion even inside your head, okay? Uh, now, if mom and dad, I'm not saying they didn't, but if mom and dad don't love you in a way that you get it, you start to feel like it must be me in some way. Because mom and dad are perfect, they're the whole universe, if I'm not getting the love I need, it must be me. We come up with a way of coping with this or dealing with it, and one of the strategies that we tend to adopt is we start to take things on. And when you take something on, you get a clap on the back. And when you get a clap on the back, you go, ooh, I like that. That's a good feeling. That's like that love thing, okay? And let me give you an example. Let's say the first time you went to school, nobody knew how you were going to do. Uh, you come home with your report card, and you have all Ds on it. Ooh, mom and dad look at that and say, oh, my God, we got a problem, okay? So they try to figure out what the problem is. They talk to you. They maybe talk to your teacher and so forth. They try to work it out. You come back, your next report card, you got all Ds again. Wow, we got a really serious problem now. So, I mean, they're trying to figure this out. They get tutors. They do all kinds of stuff. They see that you're really working. You're not goofing off. You're really trying. You're working hard. Um, you come home again. You got all Ds. At some point, all they can say to you is, good job. Keep trying, right? I mean, you know, everybody's doing their best here. We'll, we won't give up, but, you know, maybe this is it. Maybe it's as good as it gets. Um, on the other hand, let's say the first time you came home, you had all A's on your report card, maybe a couple of Bs. Uh, what had happened? Oh, my son or daughter. You're a genius, you know? That's where the bumpers get on the back of the vans, those honor student things, you know, my, my son or daughter, the honor student thing. Um, you know, you're a genius. Big clap on the back, this feels great. But now, let's say sometime later, you come home with your report card, you got a C on your report card. You think nobody says anything about that? But so, whoa, what happened here? You gotta explain your C. Why? Because people have come to expect that you get A's and B's. So now you gotta explain your C. You're not getting such a clap on the back anymore. You're supposed to get A's and B's. Now, wait a second. I, I, I was getting some of these A's and B's to get a little bit of the clap on the back thing, and I'm not getting that anymore. But I'm very adaptable. I've got a free hand. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep this hand going. I'll juggle the grade thing. I'll keep going the A's and B's, but I'm not getting much for it anymore. I've got a free hand. I'll take on something new. Maybe it's sport. So I go out again. Nobody knows how you're going to do when you first go out. And let's say when you first go out, you're really good. And people say, wow, did you see her? She was amazing. Did you see what he did? Oh, he is strong as a horse. I mean, whatever. You're getting a gigantic clap on the back, and this is just wonderful. But again, you already know where this is going, right? After a while, you maybe have a game that doesn't go so well or something's not happening. What happens? People say, whoa, what happened? And now you have to explain why you didn't win, why you weren't the champion, why you didn't perform at the same exact level you did maybe the time before, because people have come to an expect and accept that you're going to do that. Now, you're all still relatively young compared to me at least. Um, and so at some point, now there's only 100%, okay? There, there is no 110. I've heard a lot of coaches say, we're gonna give it 110%. There is no secret slice under a pie. You know, there's only 100%. Um, <laughs> so at some point, your whole 100% is in juggling and maintaining the things that have become expected and accepted, and you don't have 1% left to put into any new thing for a new clap on the back. And when you get to that point, you get a really bad feeling. It's going to be anger, depression, sadness, something. It's going to be a bad feeling. You're not going to like it. And basically what has happened is being good enough has gotten tied to being loved. And everybody, to a degree, tends to do this. So when you do well, you feel good. When you don't do well, you feel bad. And, they're, and you almost say, I can't help it. This is just how I feel. But they're not true. And so it's an important thing to recognize in life that the two have nothing to do with each other. Um, later in the book, on this, on this psychological you know, chapter, uh, I talk about a chapter called The Pressure's On. And uh, I've often said, you know, people say, I'm under a lot of pressure. Can you hand it to me? It's kind of like a slump, you know? Can you hand me a slump? I mean, they don't exist. There's no such thing as pressure. What do you, what do you mean you're under pressure? Like a vice or something? I mean, you're being squashed or... What kind of pressure is it? It's self-induced. It's your perception of things that are creating this thing that you are calling pressure. So for example, if I had a rule, let's say we have a rule in this room, okay? We have to have a dollar in our pocket at all times, okay? And I tell you now that you have 95 cents in your pocket. How do you feel? 
Most people would say, well, not good, because I'm supposed to have a dollar in my pocket. So you work really hard, you do this and that, and you get a nickel. Maybe you get 10 cents, OK? So now you have a dollar. You have a dollar five in your pocket. How do you feel? Most people will say, well, now I feel good, probably, because I, I, you know, I have my dollar, I have a dollar five. And I'd say to you, no. You feel almost just as bad as you did with when you had 95 cents in your pocket, because you could lose five cents. You could lose 10 cents. When are you going to have enough? Based on the, the recession we just went through, I, I don't know if there is enough. Um, so it would never be enough because it's an absolute rule that you feel compelled to honor and have. So what would be different would be to say, I want to have a dollar in my pocket at all times. If you said that and you had 95 cents in your pocket, well, since you want the dollar, I assume you'd go work for the nickel or the 10 cents, whatever it is. You'd say, great, got it. You actually would be happy when you get your dollar or your dollar five. And if you lost five or 10, you say, well, I'm the one who wanted the dollar. I'll go get another five or 10 cents. And you'd be actually content whether you had the dollar or not, or whether you went way above the dollar. You'd still be content in the same way. So it's important to recognize that the have tos, musts, and shoulds is what causes anxiety, pressure, uh, these kinds of things that unnerve us at times. Uh, remember, it's, it's a want to. For example, has anybody in here ever said that you have to go to work? Not one person in this room has ever said that? Okay, I got, I got one person who said they've done that. Yeah. Um, has anybody in here ever said, I have to study tonight? <laughs> like right this minute, you know? Um, so is it true? Do you have to study? No, you don't have to study. <laughs> now, now there, there are consequences to every decision, every action, right? <laughs> so for example, let's say right now that it is pouring outside. You have a choice. You could stay inside, you could run to your residence hall, uh, you could dance in the rain, you could get a baggie and put it over your head, you know, you could go do something. But if you went out there and sat on the curb and started to scream into the rain, I hate this, I'm getting wet. <laughs> I mean, they would come and probably take you away, right? <laughs> so guess what? In this situation, you don't have control over the rain. It's raining, too bad. In life, it rains. But you have a choice on how you're going to deal with the rain. Get off the curb. Go back inside. Dance in the rain. Get the bag on your head. Go over to your dorm room. Do something. But don't sit on this curb and scream about it. And so very often, that is what we are doing. We create these have tos, must, and shoulds that are artificial. They don't exist. They're self-induced. Middle part of the book. Complete switch here. Um, to making peak performance a common occurrence. I start off in this chapter six, it's the first chapter, it's called Walking on Water. And I make the argument that St. Peter walking on the water was one of the greatest peak performances of all times. And of course, people look at me and say, that wasn't a peak performance, that was a miracle. I'm like, yeah, I, I'm sure it was. There was grace there, and obviously him walking on water, I'm sure it was, uh, there was grace of God there that, that enabled that to happen. But let's look at it for a second. And let me just, you probably all know this, but this is just a short thing. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Now let's examine this for a second. Peter's on the boat. His free will is fully intact. He can stay in the boat. Peter decides to get out of the boat. He's so focused on Christ, he gets out of the boat, and he actually, literally, starts walking on the water. It's unbelievable. I mean, it, it, it's believable, but it's almost unbelievable. It's, it's incredible. It's a miracle. It's a peak performance. So as he's walking along, what happens? He starts to pay attention to some other things. He starts to focus on the wind and the waves and the tempest, and what happens to him? He begins to sink. And of course, he cries out, and then Christ saves him. But think about what just happened. It's common to every peak performance there is. When you are completely absorbed on the task at hand in the present moment, that's when peak performances happen. That's when your best comes out. When your focus shifts to other things, it's when actually your performance will drop. So if, if Peter had stayed focused on Jesus Christ the entire way, he would have walked right over to him. It's because he lost his focus. 
and that is the key to peak performance. And by the way, peak performances are happening all the time. Everybody in this room has had a peak performance of some kind. It could be the silliest thing. It could be like you rolled up a napkin, and you threw it across the room, and it lands in a cup. You go, hey, <laughs> did you see that? You know, that's pretty impressive, was it? If you're like me, you go try doing it again, of course, it's not going back in, right? Um, but people say to me, yeah, but is that really a peak performance? Well, I'll give you some examples. There's these yogis and lamas who can slow their heart rates and respirations down to, you know, five beats a minute kind of thing. Um, but people say to me, but Bill, those are, those are some, like, holy guys up on a mountain in Tibet or something. You know, I'm not, I'm not going on a mountain for, like, 50 years. I mean, I, I just, I just want to do peak performance, you know? Okay, let, let's skip that for a second. So where else do they happen? Um, there was a boy by the name of Jeremy Schill, nine years old, weighs 65 pounds. His father is working on a car in his garage. This is bad advice. It's one of these caution things underneath. Do not do this. Um, he has the car up on four jacks, okay? And he's underneath it working on the transmission. And as he's trying to maneuver the transmission out, the car falls on him, on his chest. It weighed 4,800 pounds. Jeremy, who is nine years old and weighs 65 pounds, goes up to the front of the car bumper, lifts it up enough so his father can breathe. Jeremy's not on human growth hormone. He's not taking steroids. He never lifted a weight in his life. He's picking up a 4,800-pound car. Now you're going to say to me, but Bill, that's an emergency situation. There must have been adrenaline flowing or something. Yeah, I'm sure there was adrenaline flowing. <laughs> He's still a human being, nine-year-old, 65 pounds, picking up a 4,800-pound car. But you say, yeah, but that's an emergency situation. OK, it's an emergency situation. Does it happen outside of emergency situations? Yeah. If you're familiar with Bob Beeman in the 1968 Olympics, he broke the world record in the long jump by almost two feet, which is phenomenal. Up to then, the world record was broken by two inches at a time. And I think it was only broken like eight times in the history of the long jump. He broke it by 20, almost two inches in one jump. Boom. Incredible. There's a guy by the name of uh, Pippin Ferreira. He's one of these free divers, the, the ones who like relax, take deep breaths, no equipment, and they just do these deep dives. He's, he's gone down 860 feet. That's almost like a 15-story building, OK? And he did it, and he held his breath for nine minutes. Now, again, you're going to say to me, yeah, but these are world-class athletes, Bill. You know, I mean, we've got, a, we've got a holy people. We've got emergencies. We've got, like, world-class athletes. Does it happen to anybody else? Yeah. I mean, it happens to everybody, as I just said. Um, a while back, my son Joseph, when he was young, he was maybe three or four years old. He's in our garage. I'm, like, vacuuming out the car or something, you know, and I look up out of the windshield just to make sure he's not going to get killed by something in the garage, you know, and I look over, and Joseph's standing there staring at the wall. And yeah, I know, I got a little worried, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and the wall has this pegboard, like all these holes in it, you know. And he's like staring at it. And I, 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 I kind of look at him for a few minutes. I think, you know, what's wrong with him, you know. And then I look, and in his hand, he's got a little, uh, an artist's paintbrush. doesn't have the, uh, the, the hair on it anymore. It's just like the stick part of it. And he has it in his hand, and he's staring at the wall. He's about four feet away from the wall. And suddenly I see him raise up his hand, and he throws it. It flies through the air, and it sticks in one of the holes. I said, Joseph, how'd you do that? I don't know, I just threw it in the wall, you know? <laughs> so, so, of course, you know, idiot dad goes over. First of all, I can hardly get it out of the wall. I mean, I, am, I have to pull this thing to get it out of the hole. I think, well, maybe this always happens, you know? Throwing this thing against the wall, it's not going in, okay? I get up like a spear, you know? I'm like, you know, two inches away trying to get to go in the hole. It's not going in the hole. That night at dinner, we're eating. They're having dessert, the kids, and they're eating like popsicles. One of them finishes the popsicle and drops it. It bounces on the table and stands up on its side. <laughs> I said, okay, maybe that happens all the time, too. So there I am, dropping the popsicle stick, like, you know, <laughs> hundred times. It's not standing up for me, okay? But here's the point. It happened. It was possible. But there's reasons why these things tend not to happen, and maybe I'll share a couple of those things with you. Um, I'll pick out Our Lady, and uh, let's see. Um, Okay, if you, you can't really see Our Lady from there, can you? Um, well, do your best to look through this podium and imagine that you're seeing the Blessed Mother. Uh, for those that can see the Blessed Mother right now, what I want you to do is there's a sash around her waist, and in the middle of the sash, there are actually two lines coming down. 
And one of them to the left, I don't think is coming all the way down to the bottom. Can you tell me if it is? Now, let me just ask you a question. Were you just thinking about your summer vacation? Were you thinking about your studies? Were you thinking about dinner? For a fraction of a second, you were like, what is he talking about? I can, <laughs> I can hardly see the belt from here, you know? My point is, for a fraction of a second while you were all looking, you were completely absorbed in trying to see the detail I was describing to you. Body, mind, and spirit were completely absorbed in that fraction of a second. That is the definition of focus. So when you hear people say, you know, focus, that's not focus. Focus <laughs> is attention to detail. The more detail you see in something, the more absorbed you become in it, and the more absorbed you become, that's when these things called peak performances happen. That's why you'll hear people say, I was in the zone. You know, things just happened. You know, I threw the ball in from half court. You know, whatever it was, it's, it's because at that moment, believe it or not, you were completely, totally absorbed on what you were doing. The problem with peak performances is once you come out of them, you never know whether you're going to come back into them. The only reason you knew you had it is because you came out of it. You're like, wow, that was unbelievable. Oh, I, I want to do that again. And then you're waiting and waiting and waiting and hope maybe it'll come back. But again, it's this kind of focus, attention to detail that is one of the key ingredients to making it happen. Um, when I say the word go, I want you to snap your finger as fast as you can for me. One time. Ready? Go. Okay. It's not, it's not bad. No, that's pretty good. I'm impressed. Okay. Now, I mean really fast. I know you just ate. You've been sitting around listening to me for a little bit. I mean, okay, get the blood going. Pinch the cheeks. Okay. <laughs> Ready? Go. Okay. It was definitely, would you, I want to vote. Was it faster? Okay. It, it's still, I know you have more in you though. Okay. <laughs> So I'm serious, now get ready. When I say the word go, energy, no false starts, okay? Get ready, go. Oh, I love it, okay. So <laughs> that was absolutely way faster than the first time, right? Now, just one more time, you were listening for the whole go to come out. When you hear the guh sound, I want you to snap your finger. Ready, go. <laughs> okay. Now, can I ask you a question? Why didn't you snap your finger that fast the first time? I said snap your finger as fast as you can. And it was only snapping your finger. It wasn't even that complicated. <laughs> you get the idea here? We underestimate, first of all, what we're capable of. You either didn't know you could snap your finger that fast, or you didn't know I meant snap your finger that fast, OK? You were capable of doing it, but again, it was attention to detail. You were listening. You listened for a guh sound. Okay, and you were able to react instantaneously to that. Um, anybody play soccer in here? Okay, I won't put you on the spot, but if I took a soccer goal, how many soccer balls fit across a goal mouth? If I put them all side by side? Okay. <laughs> 363. <laughs> so. Now think about this for a second, right? Anybody that plays soccer and you're shooting on goal, you always hear about like shoot to the corner, upper corner, lower corner, middle, you know, big corner. We think of these gigantic big areas. Imagine putting up 363 soccer balls, numbering them one through 363, and I say hit number 154. Hit number two. Now you may say, oh, that's impossible. No, it is not impossible. Matter of fact, I had a woman on the LPGA golf tour that I worked with, and we were at a tournament, and uh, she was warming up before going out in her first round, and the sign out there was uh, Fila, F-I-L-A, the, the clothing manufacturer, sports manufacturer. They were the sponsor of the, the practice green and, and driving range. On the 100-yard board, it says Fila, 100 yards, okay? So I said to her, she's warming up, what's your target on the first club she was gonna hit? She said, the F in Fila. I said, okay, go ahead. I've been working with her for a couple of years. She hits her first ball that lands maybe about 10 feet to the right of the sign. Now I can tell you, anybody out on tour, they'd be completely satisfied with 10 feet to the right of the sign. As a matter of fact, they'd say, wow, that was a good shot. Of course, I said to her, which she knew was coming, is that what you wanted? And she said, no. I said, I wanted the F. I said, do you think you could feel the difference between that and the F? She goes, yeah, I think I, think I can. She hits the next one over the A. Now, most people say, whoa, that is just amazing, right? But of course, you know what I asked her, right? Is that what you wanted? No, I wanted the F, you know. Do you think you could feel the difference? Yeah. 
Within three balls, she hit the F, and she did it twice in a row. At 100 yards, she hits like a one-foot letter with a golf ball. Now, I have to tell you, two things amaze me about that. The first is that she could even do it. You know, that I, I, I asked her to do it, but I was amazed she could do it. Um, here's the more important thing, and this applies to you. She would have never tried it. She didn't, she didn't know she had that kind of capacity to actually do that. You have an ability within you that you're not even coming close right now to using. That's not pressure. I'm not putting pressure on you to live up to your potential. I'm just saying it's a matter of awareness. It's recognizing the skills, talents, and abilities that you've been blessed with. And they are many, many more than you can even recognize at this point in your lives. Um, I'll finish this point about the, the peak performance thing in this way. I never put two things, these two things together. You probably did because you're a lot smarter than me. Remember, I, when I went to Maryland, they told me my major was eligibility. <laughs> so that gives you my scholarly background. Um, but I never put these two things together. The first is all of time is present to God. He's, he's got no past. He's got no future. And so to the degree that I remain in the present moment is the degree I remain in as perfect a union as I can be with God. If I ruminate about the past or I get anxious about the future, I've left him because he's here in this moment, willing my happiness and my continued existence right now, same for you, right now, this moment. But I never put this together with the sport thing before. I just told you that part of sport is putting the whole 100% into what you're actually doing in that present moment, on the details of what it takes to do whatever you're doing in that present moment. It's the same thing. It's being in the present moment. It's being completely absorbed in this present moment. And as an athlete, when I do that, I am in union with God. And I never, it was a comforting thought for me as an athlete to think about that, to think when I'm actually performing, this is true if you're a musician, this is true if you're doing anything, if you're a carpenter, whatever you are doing, if in that moment you're completely absorbed in that present moment, you're in union with God at that moment. And it's a, it's a wonderful, peaceful, comforting kind of thought. Uh, I, I appreciate it. And there's a, an individual that I particularly uh, respect and, and, you know, just uh, in awe of his life, he was a father, Walter Chiswick. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of him before. He wrote a book. Some have read his book. Uh, he wrote two books, actually, With God in Russia and He Leadeth Me. And I'd recommend actually starting with He Leadeth Me. But just succinctly here, I'll try. Uh, father Chiswick was a real rough guy growing up, you know, almost a bully kind of guy. At some point, he believes he, he's come, that he feels he has a call to vocation to the priesthood. And uh, tells his father this, who I don't think can believe it. Uh, he, I think he was getting him out of jail most of the time, and so he, he's finding this hard to believe. But, but it's a true vocational call. And at that time, the Pope was calling young men to Rome to study uh, the, the, the Russian language so that when they were ordained, they'd be able to go into Russia to evangelize and so forth. So he goes, he feels called. He feels he is called to learn Russian and go to Russia. This is like he, where he really believes he's called. He goes, by the time he's ordained and he comes out speaking fluent Russian, He's told he can't go to Russia, and they send him to Poland. He's in Poland. He's not really happy about being in Poland because he wants to be in Russia. That's where he thinks God says he's supposed to be. Well, timing's everything. It's 1939. Uh, Russia invades Poland, and he takes it as a sign from God that he's supposed to go to Russia. So he gets on a work train, and uh, the work train wasn't much better than the trains that took people to the concentration camps. And so they finally get to the work camp, and he's in, he has all these visions in his mind that the people there are just going to embrace him and be so happy that he's come and he's brought the sacraments and this is just going to be incredible. And uh, as soon as they discover he's a Catholic priest, they report him to the authorities and he's arrested. And he is then put in Lubyanka prison in solitary confinement for five years where he's tortured every single day that he's there. Almost loses his faith and his mind. Um, but at the end he tells them, you can just kill me at this point. I'm not doing what you want me to do. Uh, do whatever you're going to do to me. Well, at that point, they say, we now find you guilty. It took him five years, I guess, to figure that out. But they, we now find you guilty, and they sentence him to 15 years hard labor in Siberia. And hard labor in Siberia means you're probably not going to live. So he's sent on a cattle car in the freezing weather with almost no clothes on. He arrives, and the first day, they put him in the bottom of a coal ship, and they give him a shovel. He's been in solitary confinement for five years with no exercise. If you don't sweep the coal that's pouring down from this conveyor belt, you eventually get buried and they just put somebody else on top of you in the coal and so you spread it. So you have to keep spreading the coal in order just to stay alive. After the first eight, eight hours, he said he's completely numb. Uh, he is now having to use his elbows to move the shovel to try to shift the coal. And he's in there for 15 hours the first day. When they go back to camp, they strip search you. 
it's like 20 below zero. It takes them about an hour to do it. I don't know how you live naked for 20, you know, for an hour in 20 below zero. Back into a barracks with holes in the wood and so forth. No food, gangs. Next day, he can't even move, but if you don't move, they kill you. So he's got to find the way to move, and he goes back in the ship. Story, you could read one paragraph of this book. You say, how did he live through this paragraph? Now, why am I telling you all of this? Because of the conclusion that he came to, and I'm just going to read you this little bit. He says, to me, faith says that God has a special purpose, a special love, a special providence for all those he has created. The circumstances of each day of our lives, of every moment of every day, are provided us, for us by him. But maybe we are just a little afraid to accept it in all its shattering simplicity, for its consequences in our lives are both terrible and wonderful. It means, for example, that every moment of our life has a purpose, that every action of ours, no matter how dull or routine or trivial it may seem in itself, has a dignity and worth beyond human understanding. No man's life is insignificant in God's sight, nor are his works insignificant, no matter what the world or his neighbors or his family or his friends may think of them. Yet what a terrible responsibility is here, for it means that no moment can be wasted, no opportunity missed, since each has a purpose in man's life, each has a purpose in God's plan. For what can ultimately trouble the soul that accepts every moment of every day as a gift from the hands of God and strives always to do his will. If God is for us, who can stand against us? Nothing, not even death, can separate us from God. Nothing can touch us that does not come from his hand. Nothing can trouble us because all things come from his hand. Is this too simple or are we just afraid really to believe it, to accept it fully in every detail of our lives, to yield ourselves up to it in total commitment? This is the ultimate question of faith, and each must answer it for himself in the quiet of his heart and the depths of his soul. But to answer it in the affirmative is to know a peace, discover a meaning of life that surpasses all understanding. That's about the perfection of the present moment. And that's about our lives. That's about where God has placed you, given your families, your backgrounds, your lives, where you are today and what you're doing. It's perfect. And this is coming from a man who was tortured for like 23 years who barely can live through one of these paragraphs. He's saying this. And I'm thinking, my gosh, what am I complaining about today? What am I thinking I can't take? What is it that I'm not called to? And it helps me. It gives me great perspective to think of Father Walter. The last part of the book. I'm, I'm getting close here. You did great. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, skip over something. Well, I'm going to read you this one letter because I just think it's such an awesome letter. Uh, this is a letter from Alonzo Stagg. He was one of the greatest athletes and coaches of all time. And this is a letter that he wrote to his 14-month-old son. And I'm just going to read it to you. To my son, by the way, it was written June 23, 1900. You're only a little fellow now, a trifle over 14 months old. But I have loved you so dearly since you came that it has been on my mind to write you a letter in the event of my being taken away at any time before I had a chance to tell you many things which you need to know. Your father wants his boy, first of all, to love, protect, and care for his mother, giving her the same kind of measure of love and devotion which she has given to you. Second, your father wants his boy to be sincere, honest, and upright, and be your truest self always. Hate dishonesty and trickery, no matter how big and how great the thing desired may be. Third, your father wants you to have a proper independence of thought. Think matters out for yourself, always where it relates to your own conduct and act honestly afterwards. Fourth, your father wants you to be an American in democracy. Treat everybody with courtesy and as your equal until he proves his unworthiness to be so treated. The man and the soul are what counts, not wealth, not family, not appearance. Fifth, your father wants you to abhor evil. No curiosity, no imagination, no conversation, no story, no reading which suggests impurity of life is worthy of your thought or attention, and I beg you never to yield for it, to it in an, for an instant, but turn your thought to something good and helpful. Sixth, train yourself to be a master of yourself, of your thoughts and imagination and temper and passion and appetite of your body. Allow no thought nor imagination nor passion nor appetite to injure, injure your mind or body. 
Your father has never used intoxicating liquors, nor tobacco, nor profane language. He wants his boy to be like him in this regard. Seventh, your father wants his boy enthusiastic and earnest in all his interests, his sports, his studies, his work. He wants him always to keep an active, actual participation in each so long as he lives. It is my judgment that one's life is most healthy and most successful when lived on such a basis. And finally, eighth, your father wants his son to love God as he is revealed to him, which after all will be the revelation of all that I have said and left unsaid of good to you, my precious boy. Affectionately, your father, Amos Alonzo Stad. I don't know about you, but wow, if that, if that is the model of every coach, um, we sh everybody should have a coach. Uh, and I know here you have coaches that are trying to live that out. But that is what all of you are going to be called to, because someday you're going to leave here. You're perhaps going to get married. You'll be coaching your son or daughter's little league team. Uh, you'll be involved in it in some way. Just remember the kind of coach that you hope to be. Last thing I'm going to wrap up here with is, um, you know, world-class performance in whatever it is, whether it's sport, school, anything that you're doing in life, it, it comes at a cost. I mean, it requires a sacrifice of some kind. And uh, I'm sure everybody in here has read C.S. Lewis's The Great Divorce. Uh, but there's a one little particular section that I like. It's the angel, uh, the ghost speaking to the angel about killing the lizard on his back. Now listen to this, based on what I've just told you, about sports performance, about focus in the present moment, all these kinds of things, OK? This is the angel. There is no other day. All days are present now. Get back, you're burning me. How can I tell you to kill it? You'd kill me if you did. It's not so. Why, you're hurting me now. I never said it wouldn't hurt you. I said it wouldn't kill you. That is a lesson about life right there. Sometimes we're thinking the hurt part is like, you're hurting me. Well, I never said it wouldn't hurt, just that it's not going to kill you. Um, and it's an important part of asking the question, can we take it? Because sacrifice, love, another word for love is sacrifice. It means you're giving up something you could have kept for yourself. So this love thing, this sacrifice in your life with these trials and tribulations and good things and bad things, all the things that are going to happen to your life, can you take them when they come? And I'm going to give you an example. Imagine right now, I want you to get somebody in your mind, if you would, for me, that you love so much that you would die for them, okay? Get somebody in your mind that you love so much that you would die for them, literally. Everybody have somebody? Yes or no? It's taking you a while to think of somebody that you would die for, or...? <laughs> Does everybody have one? Yeah. Yeah. I only hear like eight people over here that got somebody. I mean, are, do you have someone? Yeah. Okay. Now, I don't know how it happens, but that person you just imagined is up here on this podium, sitting up on this podium. And I don't know how it happens, but the entire podium suddenly burst into flames. Are you going to come up here and rescue this person? Some of you don't, so I heard nothing back here. <laughs> I'm not hearing such great enthusiasm now that it's going to require it. I, would you come up here and rescue this person? Yes. Okay. Now, I pull out a flamethrower. I burn your wrist right down to the bone. Same burn, same pain. You're going to go nuts. You're, you're going to roll on the floor. You're going to scream, attack me right out into the hall. I mean, something. One burn you can take, the other you can't. Pain without a purpose is intolerable to human beings. So the question really we're left with is, what is a strong enough purpose in life? Because that's the only way you're going to get through the most challenging things that come your way in life. And if they haven't already come, they're going to be coming. So I'm going to conclude with this, my three clues. And I, I know I'm in the wrong place for this, because I have theologians here and others that can critique my three clues. But this is from a simple person telling you my three clues of life. Um, first one is God exists. Even the New York Times, I think, did a survey that said like 96, 98 percent, the number changes, you know. But 96, 98 percent of Americans believe in a higher being of some kind, okay? So there's a small percentage that are going to say they, they don't believe in a higher being, but we'll have that discussion another day. Um, so most people believe in God of some kind. Now, if you believe in God, though, that means God truly does exist, and that means whether you do anything about it or not, there's got to be a relationship between you, um, even if you don't do anything about it in some way. There's, there's some relationship. Second clue is you've only been given one thing. Everything else can be taken away from you in a second. Your, your family, your house, your legs, your car, boom, bam, they're gone in a second. The only thing you're left with is your free will. And I used to wonder, why, why would God give us that free will thing? You know, what, what's the purpose of that? I know most of you can give me a treatise probably on why we have free will. Um, but I'm going to give you maybe a simple way of thinking about it. Um, 
If I told you in a moment that somebody's coming in here and I'm paying them $5,000 a day to say they love you, okay? And they walk in here and they look in the eye and they say, I love you. You're going to say, yeah, right you do. I know you're getting paid $5,000 a day to say it. You know, it doesn't, it's not going to mean much to you at that point, okay? Even if you want it to be true, you're going to say, I, I know you're getting paid. You're kind of compelled by that money. Now, I don't know how this could happen, but God walks in here right now. Anybody going to leave this room? I'm not leaving this room, okay? God says, do you love me? What are you going to say? Now, if some people said to me, what about the atheist? I said, the atheist thing all over, okay? There are no more atheists. God's in the room. So when God says, do you love me? Even the atheists at this point are saying, because they know the consequence of saying no, okay? So, so humbly, they're now saying yes. Um, we all would be humbly saying yes. So here's the point. It doesn't mean as much because our free will is to choose God. And the reason he gave us free will is so that we could love. So anytime you love in your life, I mean, if you ever get married, if they hold a gun to your head, it doesn't count, okay? You've got to freely choose the person you're marrying. You've got to freely choose to love God. And that's why he gives you that free will. The third clue, final clue is, not to be morbid about this, but we're all going to die, okay? Um, give me an age. How long are you going to live? Don't tell me like 35 or something, okay? So, because I won't be able to continue at that point. Um, give me an age. How long are you going to live? I heard 100. I'll go with 100, okay? 100's a real nice positive number. We're a round number, okay? Um, if you would for me right now, in your mind, I, I'm, I'm sorry to do this to you, but imagine the worst pain in the world, okay? Worst pain in the world that you could imagine, okay? Sorry to do that to you. Okay, um, now with the movement of your hand, you already had some practice. Uh, show me how fast a second is. Ready, go. Show me half a second. Show me hundreds of seconds, thousands of seconds, millionth of a second. I like that you're trying, okay? Um, <laughs> let's, let's make it ridiculous, a billionth of a second. Uh, wow, I got people still, you guys, you guys are like overachievers here, you know what I mean? Um, Okay, so that billionth of a second, if, if that pain you imagined would come and go in less than a billionth of a second, and you would absolutely have no after effect at all, could you take it? You wouldn't even know you had it, right? But let's go back to the, to the age thing. You said you might live to 100. Somebody positively back there was a positive person at 100, okay? How long is 100 in relation to all of eternity, all of time? It's faster, in a sense, than the billionth of a second. And you just told me you could take the worst pain in the world for a billionth of a second. That's your life. God has put you here for the shortest amount of time in his mercy. He's put you here for a fraction of a second in terms of all of time, and he's asking just one question. Do you love me? And sometimes I know, we're like, I, I, something wrong with us. We're like, oh, you know, this week was so hard. Oh, this happened. Oh, I didn't get that. Oh, this didn't work out for me. We're like crazy people. And God then is saying to us this, not give me the lip service of your words, because I don't know about you, the way you know your friends here, the way you get to know people, isn't by what they say. You watch them. You hope what they say matches what they do, but the way you know each other is by what you do. That's how you really know someone. And that's our lives. He puts us down here in this world, gives us the families we have, gives us the relationships we have, gives us the future, jobs, careers, whatever else we might have, and he's saying to you, okay, I'm going to give you opportunity for sacrifice in your life. I'm going to give you opportunity to love. And depending on how you take those sacrifices on is how you answer the question. And that is a strong enough purpose. That, that life dedicated to living out your yes, your fiat, like the Blessed Mother. And I'm going to leave you with this. My favorite quote on sport, it applies to women as equally as to men. It was addressed to men, so you'll hear the male pronoun in there. But certainly this is meant for women as well as for men. And I'll tell you who it's by after I recite it to you. But it goes like this. Sport, properly directed, develops character, makes a man courageous, a generous loser, and a gracious victor. It refines the senses, gives intellectual penetration, and steals the will to endurance. It is not merely a physical development then. Sport, rightly understood, is an occupation of the whole man. And while perfecting the body is an instrument of the mind, it also makes the mind itself a more refined instrument for the search and communication of truth and helps man to achieve that end to which all of us must be subservient, the service and praise of his creator. Believe it or not, that is by Pope Pius XII at an address he gave called Sport, the Service of the Spirit. To me, that should be the foundational 
mission statement of every Catholic sports team, certainly every Christian sports team, uh, and I'm asking you to memorize that. If I can do it, I'm the litmus test. If I can do it, I know you can do it. Um, and so I'm asking you to memorize that and share that with people because that is how we should be living this out. It takes sport from its most generic level and lifts it to the very highest.